The righteous will prosper. The wicked will wither. Follow this way and all will go well with you. Follow the foolish way and you'll have huge problems. This is the right way. This is the wrong way. Okay? And the, the notion of rewards runs right through the Deuteronomic history as well as through the book of Proverbs. Uh, you reap what you sow. It's the constant message of conventional wisdom. If you uh, follow the right way, your life will not end up in the dead ends of existence. Okay? That's what I mean by the domestication of reality and the domestication of life. We know how things are. God has told us. Do this, you will do well. Now, the other voice is the voice of protest against this. In the Hebrew Bible, we see that voice of protest most clearly in the book of Job and in the book of Ecclesiastes, both of which are radical criticisms of conventional wisdom. Both of them say, life is not that simple. Look around you. You see good people suffering. You see wicked people flourishing. Reality is far more mysterious than our roadmaps can make it. In the book of Job, for example, it is the friends of Job, as you all know, who are advocates of conventional wisdom. Job is suffering enormously. The book of Job provides no answer whatsoever to the problem of suffering. If you read it that way, you're missing the point. Okay? Instead, what's going on in the book of Job is Job is suffering immensely, and his friends, you know, they're trying to help him out, but their constant message is, well, you must have done something wrong. We, we all know that the righteous n never suffer. We all know if something's wrong with your life, it's because you haven't got it together. <laughs> Confess your sin before God. They are the voice of conventional wisdom. And what's fascinating, it's a perfect illustration of how you gotta be really careful when you quote scripture. If you quote the friends of Job, <laughs> you're not quoting the word of God in a sense. You know what I mean? I mean, they, they are explicitly declared in the book to be wrong, okay? And of course, the, if there is a resolution of the, uh, problems uh, found in the book of Job, it comes in that magnificent concluding five chapters, the voice from the whirlwind where the character Job is given a display of the glory of God in the universe, doesn't answer the question of suffering whatsoever. What it does suggest is reality is far wilder than any of our domestications can make it out to be. And when you behold the wildness and the splendor and the utter magnificence of undomesticated reality, there's no way you can doubt the reality of the sacred. You have no answers to the question of suffering, but the question of God is not uh, raised by the problem of unresolved suffering. God is. The radical message of the scripture all the way through, and it's the, it is the first question, Job is the first book, is that God is, that God's faithfulness, God's love is, God is with us. There is no place that we can go that is so low that God does not stay with us and seek to comfort us if we will be comforted in it. But I think, the, you know, it's the same question that resurrection engages, is that we don't, we don't rule this world. We don't, um, God does not rule the ins and outs of this world. God is a force for what is good. God is his force for God's justice. We are stuck living that out and trying to live that out faithfully. The luck of the world, wealth, prosperity, comfort, power, is not ever for us a sign of God's love. That is a profoundly heretical thing to say. We can't say, thank God, I have a nice sofa, or thank God for my new SUV. No, that is not of God. That might be what you want, and you got what you wanted. That is not of God. But if we go there and thank God for the good stuff, which is, a, I think, a really problematic way to imagine God, then, what do you, then you end up with an impossible situation when a child has cancer. And so I think if we don't make the first mistake, we don't have to make the second one.